Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And the response to the last video, Austerlitz 1805, Napoleon's first masterpiece, was really, really fantastic. And there was a couple comments in there that said, hey, if you want to continue on the rest of this series, I'm along for the ride. So you guys asked, I shall deliver. So for that, we actually need to take a step backwards because this was not epic history. Well, I actually don't know if it was Epic History's first video on Napoleon. I didn't look chronologically, but within this series, it is the first video because it is the Siege of Toulon, 1793. So this is really where Napoleon's reputation began. Toulon is obviously in France, and then this is against the, the royalists, right? So at this point, the French Revolution is going on, and there is a royalist sector. So those would be people that are loyal to the king, and as well as the revolutionaries, right? So there's practically a civil war going on in France, as well as every single nation around them, basically, also declares war on them at the same time. So France has enemies abound, and Napoleon is ready to step up and really make his mark. So this one's 12 years before Austerlitz, his first masterpiece. So within that time, um, he was obviously up to many, many other things. And if you want a little bit more history on that one, go check out my oversimplified video on Napoleon. Without further ado, if you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Let's get into it. TV History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. It's cool, I've never heard of that before. Osprey. In the summer of 1793. I've never seen the Muses map before. The French Revolution map was entering its fourth year. France was on the verge of anarchy. In Paris, political extremists had seized control of the revolution. God, Danton is so ugly. Sorry. They guillotined oh. the king and imposed a reign of terror that dealt summary justice to all suspected enemies of the revolution. Hoping to unify the new republic, France's leaders had declared war on the Habsburg Empire. But the conflict quickly widened, and soon France was facing the combined might of Europe's leading powers, determined to stamp out her dangerous political experiment. Meanwhile, whole regions of France had come out in open revolt, horrified by the new extremism of the revolution. So just take a second to look at this. So France has enemies on every single one of, except for Switzerland, thanks for being neutral Switzerland, on every single one of its borders. And so I find it funny that like modernly France sort of has this reputation of, oh, as soon as it gets into a conflict, throw up the white flag, surrender. But France's victory rate throughout time, and if I remember a certain comment that I, I said this before, I was like, what was their victory percentage? It's something like 73%. Right, it was like 73 or 65, or it was one of those numbers that, but they've won the majority of the conflicts that France has ever been in. I mean, look at this. You would think that the country would just collapse, but yet it would go on to be a superpower and eventually practically rule half of Europe. In August, the Republic suffered a further potentially fatal blow when the city of Toulon joined the revolt. Yeah. Toulon was France's largest and most important naval base in the south, home to a third of the entire French navy. Well, but no now, way. rebels welcomed their old enemy, the British Royal Navy, into the port, led by Admiral Lord Hood, aboard HMS Victory. It was an extraordinary coup. Without a shot being fired, the Allies had crippled French naval power in the Mediterranean mm. and gained a vital toehold on the French coast. All French forces in the area were immediately diverted to face this new threat and lay siege to the rebel port. 19,000 troops in all, but since most wow. French officers had been aristocrats who were now fleeing the revolution in large numbers, they were seriously short of professional leadership. Their commander, General Jean-Francois Carteau, was a loyal Republican, but a court painter by trade, with no military training. To make matters worse, one of his few professional officers, his artillery commander, Colonel Dom Martin, 
had been badly wounded on the approach to Toulon. Mm. Antoine Salicetti, a Corsican deputy of the National Convention in Paris, recommended as his replacement a fellow countryman, a 24-year-old artillery officer who was passing Toulon en route to the front, named Napoleone Buonaparte, yep. or Bonaparte. So important to remember, so he does change his name. The reason why is that Buonaparte obviously sounds more, and that was, that was like with the Spanish accent, sorry about that, but um, Buonaparte obviously sounds more Corsican, which is where he's from. Napoleon is not really French in that sense. He's actually Corsican, which is important to note, but he would eventually go on to change his name to Bonaparte, which obviously sounds more French. And man, 24, I mean, I'm 27, so three years, you know, three years my junior, and he's already, a, you know, a captain that's commanding some serious troops in a very, very serious conflict. Crazy. What were you doing Bonaparte was a professional soldier, but he'd seen almost no active service. Nevertheless, Salicetti was impressed by his manner, and most of all, his politics. Bonaparte had just written a political pamphlet a short story about a young artillery officer who berates his fellow diners for their disloyalty to the Republic. General Carteau thought it wise to accept okay. Deputy Salicetti's recommendation. <laughs> That's a cool quote. The great port of Toulon was well defended by city walls, and a dozen outlying forts and redoubts. They were held by 2,000 British soldiers and sailors, 6,000 Spanish troops, 6,000 Neapolitans, and 800 Sardinians. Artillery would be the key to overcoming these formidable defences. But when Bonaparte was put in command of the artillery on the 16th of September, he found himself with few cannon, not enough trained gun crews, mm. and a shortage of gunpowder and shot. And yet, these are the perfect conditions for Napoleon to thrive. Consistently, as we'll see throughout all these videos, and from the videos that I've watched already, um, particularly with Oversimplified and whatnot, is that <laughs> when he's outmanned and outgunned, he thrives. And in the last video on Austerlitz, I'm sorry, I can't remember the, uh, the, the commentator off the top of my head, but they also mentioned that it was actually wrong. Um, the allied numbers that they had at Austerlitz in, in Epic History TV's video, it was actually even larger. So the ratio, I believe it was like six to one or something like this. It was even larger than Epic History TV reported. So, yeah. With relentless energy and determination, Bonaparte transformed the situation requisitioning unused guns, training infantrymen to work them, setting up a new forge and workshop, and arranging transport from Marseille of 100,000 sandbags for constructing new batteries. The Through energy. hard work, the energy. he was ultimately able to build his force up to 64 officers and 1,500 men, manning 100 cannon, howitzers and mortars. Wow. Within days, Bonaparte had established two new forward batteries with good revolutionary names, La Montagne and Sans Culottes, which brought Toulon's inner harbour within range and forced Admiral Hood to move all his ships closer to the port. Sorry, maybe maybe a French speaker could help here, but La Montagne and Sans Culottes, why are those revolutionary names? If maybe you could put that down below if you speak French. I'd actually be very curious and I'll pin it as well if you if you write it down there. Bonaparte also came up with a plan, one that would allow the French to bypass most of Toulon's defences and secure the rapid victory the Republic so desperately needed. Bonaparte the right argued guy. that if Fort Leguilette could be captured, which looked out across the harbour, he could fill it with heavy guns and shell the British and Spanish fleet at anchor. Admiral Hood would be forced to abandon the port and take with him the Allied soldiers that Toulon relied on for its defence. General Carteau saw the merits of Bonaparte's plan 
and on the 22nd of September, French forces attacked Montcair. But to Bonaparte's exasperation, while he'd argued for an attack by 3,000 men, the indecisive Carteau committed only 400. Oof. Yeah, OK. Not only was the attack easily repulsed, but it alerted the Allies to the danger. Within 48 hours, they'd reinforced Montcair with thousands more troops and built a new fort named Fort Mulgrave, bristling with 20 cannon. Mm. The position was Three now hours. so strong, the French nicknamed it Little Gibraltar. <laughs> Finally, in mid-November, an experienced professional soldier arrived to take command of French forces. General Dugomier. Hmm, he saw okay. at once that Bonaparte's plan was the only way to take Toulon, and gave it his full backing. Bonaparte, promoted to Major, got to work, overseeing construction of several more batteries in preparation for the decisive assault. One forward battery was so exposed to enemy fire that men refused to be sent there. So Bonaparte renamed it La Batterie des Hommes Sans Peur, the battery of men without fear. And suddenly cool. there was no shortage <laughs> of volunteers. That's so cool. That's such like, <laughs> that's such a masculine thing. I got to admit, like, as soon as something's called, like, yes, the battalion of no fear, or the battalion of this or whatever, you're like, yeah, I want to be a part of that. And that's funny. Just a simple name change. You're like, I have no fear. I want to be a part of this. That's, that's fantastic. It was an early display of Napoleon's genius for inspiring his soldiers. Yeah, like, it's brilliant. One that would serve him well in so the simple. years ahead. On the 30th of November, the Allied Land Forces commander... British General Charles O'Hara tried to seize back the initiative, leading an assault on the new French batteries facing Fort Malbousquet. At first the attack was successful. The batteries were overrun, and the French guns spiked. But a counter-attack with much greater numbers, and led in person by General Dugomier and Major Bonaparte, drove back the Allies. General mm. O'Hara himself was shot through the hand and captured. Ouch. Twelve years before, he'd surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown during the American War of Independence. Oh, that's now, cool. He got to surrender to Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, that's okay. Come on, that's kind of cool. That's like, that's not the most powerful flex, but saying that you that you surrendered to George Washington and Napoleon Bonaparte. I don't know, I think that's kind of cool, to be honest. It's in some weird way. In the early hours of the 18th of December... The early videos are really interesting. Just the, the change that they've done in the graphics is, is cool to see, actually. And as this series goes on, it's going to be cool to notice the differences. In howling wind and driving rain, the French launched a major assault on Fort Mulgrave. The wet conditions made muskets useless, except as clubs or with bayonets. Bonaparte led the second wave in person. Amid fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting, his horse was killed under him, and he was bayoneted in the thigh by a British sergeant, a wound that came within inches of ending his life and radically changing the course of history. To say the least. Finally, the Allied garrison was overwhelmed, and Mulgrave fell to the French. Fort Leguilette and Tour de la Balakière were soon also in French hands. By the following afternoon, the French had ten heavy guns in Leguilette placing the Allied ships within range. Admiral Hood could not expose his valuable ships of the line to such a threat. 
he had no option but to order an immediate evacuation of the fleet and garrison no. from Toulon. Then but then they're just going to pick them off. Small Spanish and British teams raced to destroy all the French ships and naval stores that they couldn't take with them. Chaos. But amid the chaos wow. of their departure, 18 ships of the line were allowed to fall back into French hands. A badly missed opportunity. Wow. Many French citizens of Toulon were desperate to escape aboard the Allied ships, knowing that the Republicans would inflict terrible reprisals on the city. Mm. Mm. British and Spanish ships took as many as they could, about 14,000 in all, but scores wow. were drowned amid chaotic and desperate scenes. Others were left to face the wrath of the revolution. Republican troops entered the city the next morning, and executions and firing squads began almost immediately. For the next two weeks, about 200 were executed every day. Allied propaganda later blamed Bonaparte for the atrocities, but there's no evidence he was directly involved. Yeah. Shame. Never France's been, young. What is that? Then? And has never been well understood. Why would he think it was not well understood exactly? I'm kind of curious on that one. If there's any more detail, maybe put it down below if you know. France's young republic was now fighting back on all fronts. And with the fall of Toulon, the Allies had lost a golden opportunity a chance to stir up further revolt, deal a lasting blow to French naval power perhaps even overturn the revolution. But instead, the French Republic had weathered one of its greatest storms. In no small part, thanks to the remarkable judgment, energy and courage of one 24-year-old artillery officer, now promoted Brigadier General in recognition of his extraordinary service at wow. Toulon. From Napoleon Captain Bonaparte Brigadier General had taken his first step on the path to greatness. Crazy. And for Europe, 21 years of almost constant war awaited. And a change that you can argue Our sponsor is still being felt today. Osprey Publishing has nearly 200 titles on the Napoleonic Wars alone. Cool, and go check those out if you're interested. All right. Napoleon's first victory, Siege of Toulon. Again, pretty smart idea. And the fact that they were just, it was complete chaos there at that end. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? I can see why they made a video about this specifically, but this is only the first of very many. So I'm gonna be doing all of them. I will do this entire series. It's not gonna be back to back. I'm not just gonna put out 26 videos on Napoleon, but I will be doing all of them as, you know, and throw in a couple videos here and there that are not related to it. but. I'm going to get this series done. Thank you very much for joining me. Let me know what you thought in the comment section down below. And look out for the next one. It's going to be 1806. If I remember correctly, that's Jenna. If I remember correctly. If not, be out on the lookout for that one. Take care. Thank you very much for joining me. All the best. I'll see you guys in the next video. Ciao, ciao.